Yeah. Well, it rained every day. It rained so hard. It's raining, raining all the time. Mm -hmm. oh, that's nice. Nice. Ice, rain, wind. Oh, oh, oh. oh, yeah. oh bummer. <laughs>
right? In the evening? Yes. Like five to seven to thirty. I don't know. Five to seven. It was so close. Five to seven. Wednesday at 18. Shop till you drop. Okay, anything else going on? Anything else? Okay, now we're going to worship. Heck yeah, we're going to, and we're going to start with our affirmation of faith. I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and I confess him as Lord and Savior.
suffering, to meet needs, and to see all people equally as, as part of our, our human family and not to divide up folks, to, to, to draw lines between us and them, insiders and outsiders, to see everyone as people, human beings, brothers and sisters that you love. Today, Lord, there are many people we love who are, are ill, who are suffering and need your healing touch. And today, we, we lift up to you the co ops and the podies and the slappers. We pray that, that uh, the healing for them, that, uh, that Frank would get to come home from the hospital very soon. We also ask for healing for Bill. We give you thanks for the good news that Rodney received. We continue to pray for healing for him and your blessing upon his family. Continue to heal for healing and comfort and, and, and blessing for Sue and her family. We also ask for your blessing upon Joyce and for a successful procedure on Wednesday. We pray that uh, she is able to have the the basic procedure possible to uh, remedy her heart condition. And also, we want to give you thanks for our back to school bash. It was a, a wonderful time. We give you thanks for all the people who attended, all the volunteers that made it happen. We give you thanks for the wonderful vacation that will be taken and have been taken. And we also give you thanks for um, for um, Mike and Jane's new grandson Cody and we ask for health for him and your blessing upon him and his family and we give you thanks for all this in the name of our Savior Jesus Christ who taught us to pray. Our Father who art in heaven hallowed be thy name thy kingdom come thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. life 
difficult for other people. For example, last week when I talked about keeping the Sabbath, I implied that the Pharisees were extra nitpicky when it came to that because they thought Jesus' disciples had broken the law when they grabbed some snacks in a cornfield on the Sabbath. And I'll stand by my judgment of nitpickiness, especially from my 21st century point of view. However, those Pharisees, they honestly thought their way was God's way. They really did. And they didn't invent this way on their own. Like that megachurch preacher I just mentioned, mentioned that this is what they were taught. They, they were taught how to see the world and everyone in it. A world full of uh, insiders and outsiders. They didn't all just meet up one day in the early first century and decide, let's all be super judgy from now on. I mean, really, really annoying and condescending all the time. But that never happened. They didn't do that. The Pharisees and many, many other ancient Jews were taught to see the world through the lens of Leviticus 19, verse 2, B. You shall be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. And that sounds good, right? Holy is good. However, holiness in Hebrew was about being separate, about honoring the distinct lines between God's people and the rest of the world. Just as God's holiness was understood to be God, to be God's nature as holy, other, and separate from creation. Consequently, Pharisaic interpretation of the law was concerned with categories and classifications, with boundaries and borders as a way of stay, staying, staying sorry, separate from the world themselves. And this pursuit of holiness pr produced a system of classification that set down binaries or dividing lines that could be easily identified. Like pure, impure, clean, unclean, healthy, sick, Jew, Gentile, able, disabled, honor, shame, male, female, adult, child, young, elderly, poor, rich, powerful, powerless, righteous, right, unrighteous, no, sinner, uh, moral, and immoral. So basically, the Hebrew holiness codes had the effect of being preoccupied with who's in and who's out. But many of these distinctions were obviously not a matter of choice. They were a matter of one's birth. See, the Pharisees and many other ancient Jews believed that God blesses some and curses others. For example, if you're rich and healthy, if you're male and a Jew, and if you enjoy the privilege of high status, these are all signs of God's blessing. On the other hand, if you're sick, if you're a female, if you're a Gentile, if you're disabled or born poor, these are all signs of God's disfavor. And the way these binaries worked was to project the, others, the other characteristics of blessing or curse upon a person. For instance, if you were born rich, healthy, able, and a male Jew, you received the benefit of the doubt when it came to purity, honor, power, and righteousness. On the other hand, if you were born poor, sick, disabled, female, and a Gentile, it was taken for granted that you were impure, an object of shame, powerlessness, and a sinner. And because of this emphasis on boundary lines, anything that straddled or blurred the lines was viewed as impure or unclean as well. Even things that simply uh, stayed a little too close to the line were viewed with unease and suspicion. Like, for example, a feminine men or masculine women, cloth made of two different materials, or intermarriage between the Jew and the Gentile. You see, to be considered pure and therefore holy as God is holy, there must be no blending, no, no, no blurring of the lines. And this is the lens through which the Pharisees and many other ancient Jews saw the world. 
And then along came Jesus, thank God, and he greatly challenged the religious elite's system of purity that always seemed to disproportionately advantage those who already enjoyed great privilege. And at the heart of this debate lies an argument over the very nature of God. Whereas holiness occupied a central place in the dominant view of first century Judaism, because remember, you, you shall be holy, for I, the Lord, I, the Lord your God, am holy. Jesus challenged the purity system by offering a different vision for the nature of God. Be merciful, just as your Father is merciful. Yes, Jesus presents mercy as central to the nature of God. It's, it's a way of saying that God feels the feelings of others who suffer, and he's moved to act to ease their suffering. Yes, those who suffer, those who found themselves on the wrong side of the purity binary, have captured God's heart. As Jesus said at the very beginning of his Sermon on the Plain, from which our scripture comes, Back, we're backing up to chapter, verse 20 and 21. Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who are hungry now, for you will be filled. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. Amen. And those are people with whom Jesus spends most of his time, which is absolutely the Jesus we all know. But it was downright apocalyptic to the Pharisees and the Jewish elites back then because what Jesus revealed threatened to redraw the boundary lines his adversaries counted on to help them navigate the world. Yes, Jesus revealed that, that they cannot truly see through their lens of holiness, and instead he offers us all the Father's lens of mercy. And just to be clear, mercy is much more than punishment withheld. This has to do with God's faithfulness and care, regardless of our circumstances or obedience to Him and His law and His will. This is God's love in action. It is His compassionate nature to forgive and offer aid to those in need, as our Lord Jesus did throughout His ministry and as we are all called to do today. However, it is still very tempting to draw boundary lines. Yes, we are still inclined and sometimes encouraged to make distinct distinctions between insiders and outsiders. We can lose our, our mercy lens and pick up our, our, our man-made holiness lens, and then the world becomes a cold, functional mosaic. mosaic Mosaic, with every little piece in its place, just like it's supposed to be. Be on the lookout for that. And instead, you know, I tell you, this whole thing reminds me, as I went through court kids, I kept thinking of this, this old saying, a stranger is just a friend you haven't met yet. That's a very good example of someone looking through the lens of mercy. And I encourage you to go and do likewise. Amen. Amen. And if you would like to become a member of this congregation, we ask you to come forward after our communion.
that he sent his son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, to reveal his love for all of us. And most fully, he did that in the gift of his life, giving his life on the cross for each and every one of us to set us free from the power of sin and death. And now we, we celebrate that great gift here with the bread that represents his body and the cup, his blood. And we celebrate the eternal life we have in his name. For it was on the night when our Lord was betrayed that he took bread. And when he gave him thanks, he broke it. He said, this is my body that is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup. He said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as we eat this bread and drink the cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Please pray with me. Holy and loving God, we give you thanks for the invitation to your son's table. We give you thanks for the bread and for the cup. And we ask your blessing upon it. We ask that this would truly be a time of holy communion with you. And we ask this in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Come to the table.